Intel is officially announcing two of its Battle Mage GPUs. It's the B580 and the B570. In a press briefing, Intel's Tom Peterson, who used to be NVIDIA's Tom Peterson, expressed confidence in outperforming NVIDIA's RTX 4060 in several scenarios. But he also said, quote, we are crushing AMD in one of the specific comparisons. So we'll get into all that. The cards announced are the B580 and the B570. The B580 is $250 base and the B570 is $220 base. Intel will be shipping an official model directly at $250, with more partners joining for this round to also sell their variations. There is no B750 or B770 or B790 announced at this time, so there's no replacement for the A750 and A770 that were well known last time. Intel's B580 launches on December 13th, the B570 should launch on January 16th or so. As for the naming, Intel continues to deviate from the norm of creating nine generations of thin and then running out of numbers because five digits is crazy. Unless you're Intel, in which case you revert back to three digits plus a number and a couple weird words for the CPUs. But for the GPUs, they're doing letters. So Alchemist was first, next is Battle Mage, Celestial and Druid should follow. Now, we're deeply concerned here because if you're paying attention, that is a lot of casters in terms of like RPG classes. And they just, they don't have a tank. They don't have DPS. They don't have a healer. There's not a lot of options for the letter E for things that aren't also casters. I mean, Evoker, Exorcist, I guess Explorer, but like, come on, really? Uh, it's not really until they hit F that they at least get a fighter. And then they can, if they survive for five generations, they finally get a healer. Anyway, D&D and RPG classes aside, Intel's new Battle Mage GPUs will use a totally new architecture. These follow the company's A-Series or Alchemist GPUs from the last couple years launched in 2022 somewhat silently with the A380. But let's get into it. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic and the Liquid Freezer 3, which we've tested using our standard methodology and found to be one of the most noise-efficient CPU coolers on our charts. The Liquid Freezer 3 includes Ryzen offset mounting to improve AMD performance and uses a thicker radiator to further lower the temperatures. Arctic has priced these competitively for AIOs, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. All right, straight into the details today. First, Intel's $220 and $250 price means that the closest current competitors, barring whatever NVIDIA and AMD launch early next year, would be these. The RTX 4060 is currently around $290 to $300. The RX 6600 is $190. The RTX 3060 is about $270. Intel's own A770 is around $230. The 6600 XT, when it's available, is also a competitor. And then the RX 7600 is about $250 or so, among other cards. And these are just quick prices from Newegg. And now a quick recap of the Alchemist specs for a reference point. So Intel's A580 GPU has an advertised graphics clock of 1700 MHz with boosting up to 2000 MHz per TPU's database. The A580 has 8 GB of GDDR6 memory on a 256-bit bus, with that bus width being rare at the price class these days. 3072 shading units are on it. There's 175 watt TDP, eight megabytes of L2 cache, 24 RT cores, and memory bandwidth of 512 gigabytes per second per uh, the TPU database listing and prior specs from the ARC ARC page. That's the second one is with a K, not a C, the first one's with a C. The new B580 will have 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory on a smaller 192 bit bus with 456 gigabyte per second bandwidth. The Sparkle data sheet for its B580 Titan notes a 2740 MHz boost clock, which would be a substantial uplift over the A580's boost that TPU says is closer to 2000 MHz. The spec sheet notes 20 RT units, 20 XE cores, and a 200 watt total board power. Intel is still stating that rebar is required, which would be present on all modern motherboards and basically all relevant older ones. But if you happen to be someone who's upgrading something really old, then Intel Arc has been problematic if rebar is not available. We've talked about that in the past. As for the total board power of the Titan, which is a specific SKU that Sparkle's doing, it's not an Intel thing, uh, Sparkle has room, like any other board partner, to boost higher board power for higher boost clocks and for additional overclocking uh, overhead. And so you'll see a range of board power on the different partner models. This is the data sheet for the Sparkle B570 Guardian OC. There is no A570 desktop SKU to compare against, so this one's sort of out there on its own. The B570 Guardian has a 2660 MHz clock, down 80 MHz from the B580 comparison we just made with one of Sparkle's other cards. It has XE cores down two units to 18. 
RT units are also down by two. Memory is down to 10 gigabytes on GDDR6 on a smaller 160-bit bus. There is a 380 gigabyte per second claimed bandwidth and a 170 watt claimed TDP. Now these TDP numbers will vary based on the partner model. Intel also told the press that it is using the N5 TSMC process. So uh, Intel is not making this at its own fabs, but it hasn't for much of anything recently that we cover. The die is 272 millimeters squared, and Intel noted that this is the XE2 BMG G21 SOC architecture. So the actual name is sort of the the base chip that we're talking about, that's what it is. It was not intentional marketing, but we do sell dice and sometimes they roll. All right, so we've previously covered architectural details for XE2. We have a whole video on that. It will be linked below. Uh, this information came out with some of the Lunar Lake discussion for mobile, where XE2 is already detailed, it's used in some other parts, and now we're just seeing it in desktop. But they are largely reflected the same way in, in the desktop version. Uh, Tom Peterson noted that Quote, the primary thing that we've done is move to support native SIMD16, which he says is the width of their instructions. And that's where they see some uplift. This is the full BMG G21 die at 272 millimeters squared. Various pieces of this can be toggled or fused for Intel's product level decisions. The full GPU has five render slices, 20 XE cores, 20 RT units, 20 texture samplers, 10 pixel backends, and 18 megabyte L2 cache and 192-bit memory bus at most. This image shows a render slice for XE2. Intel highlights a native SIMD16 ALUs, earlier high z culling for small primitives, and an overhaul to the ray tracing hardware. All of this stuff we talked about in a lot more detail several months ago, and again, that's linked below. At an XE core level, Intel has eight 512-bit vector engines, eight 2048-bit XMX engines, and what it noted is a larger 256 kilobyte shared L1 cache. There was a heavy focus on ray tracing in its briefing. Intel pointed to a 1.5x increase in traversal pipelines, 1.5x increase in box intersections to 18, doubling in triangle intersections to two, and doubling of BVH cache to 16 kilobytes. Sparkle also sent us this roadmap. There are some minor discrepancies from the data sheets as some of the information was not final at the time of us receiving it. This should all get locked in within the next days though. Sparkle notes an HDMI 2.1 maximum support and DP 2.1 support. The card dimensions are listed as 2.2 slots. This particular model lists a 2800 megahertz boost clock and 210 watt TDP suggesting there may be some OC headroom as well. Intel has also told us that the B580 and B570 are running a PCIe Gen 4x8 configuration. This is something they directly noted to us, but that's a factor we'll talk about more in the review discussion. Intel is positioning B580 as a direct competitor to the RTX 4060, but they're doing it specifically at 1440p. It wasn't a lot of discussion about 1080p, Intel's reasoning for this. I mean, it's like any time a manufacturer pulls a resolution out of a hat, uh, that one looks good for them, and then they find the justification for it. So in this instance, the uh, sales data supports a trend towards finally higher resolution displays, despite still a lot of market saturation from 1080p, and so that's their reasoning for it. Now, uh, the company stated that the larger frame buffer is particularly beneficial versus the 4060's more limited 8 gigabyte frame buffer, where in certain situations, Intel is able to outperform and make use of that. So we'll run our own numbers, but let's take a look at theirs just to set the expectations and know what our benchmark is uh, to validate against in a few weeks. The first party image here claims that at 1440p and high quality in Forza Motorsport, the B580 is showing with Ultra RT a 64.5% improvement going to 51 from 31 FPS. With high RT, we see the B580 improving by 12.3% uh, going to 64 FPS from 57. We're not sure where their, how their 116 number was calculated here, but uh, we're just doing all the math ourselves for the FPS numbers so that it's treated consistently and fairly. And then for high without RT, the difference has the 4060 in the lead here at 86 to 77, which is about an 11.7% improvement over the B580 with the 4060 in an advantage. This particular slide is actually really cool. I like this one, uh, it shows some interesting stuff. So this shows an intra-frame analysis from a single frame ripped out of a Fortnite session at 1440p. The horizontal axis is for the API call execution by count with the vertical axis representing time. 
And here, since it's one frame, we're seeing one entire frame time. The wider of these lines shows an A-series GPU against B-series. The native execute indirect benefit is shown as 1.1 six milliseconds initially then if we're reading this right it continues to accumulate benefit with render base pass after that the deferred lighting pass sees a reduction in frame time requirement of 0.29 milliseconds at the spike where it begins to happen with another 0.41 millisecond reduction during volumetric fog for UAV L1 caching. There are other gains not specifically listed here, but they are shown in the total frame time number. Lower is better as always for these. We just thought it was a cool illustration to see of what's happening within a frame because what they're basically doing is breaking out the individual improvements and trying to say uh, the performance of it is partly from this and this other thing and this other thing. Whereas normally you just kind of hand wave and say it's all just architecture. So it is cool to see that breakout. This lineup compares Intel's B580 to the RTX 4060. Again, these are first party. We'll have our own soon. Uh, this is at 1440p Ultra. Intel claims that it holds an average 10% advantage over NVIDIA based on its cross section of games with the total range at 0.83x to 1.43x. So it loses in some as well. The company is also claiming an advantage in performance per dollar metrics comparing to a $300 4060 and a $270 7600. Intel makes this claim for both RT and rasterization performance. Intra-company, Intel claims that it's uplift over its own prior A750, which should be a larger GPU configuration, uh, but on the older architecture, averages at 24% improved. There are no presented conditions in which Intel drops below 1.0 baseline, indicating no at least shown areas of regression. Now we'll briefly look at the cooling solutions. Starting with Intel's B580 model, which it says is limited, the card has kept some of the plastic styling and molding of the face, but moved to a fuller flow through area. Intel has shortened the PCB, stuck with an 8-pin connector, and cut a large hole in the backplate to allow air to flow through. The shorter PCB allows this. In our testing under some conditions, we've observed up to a 5 degree improvement in 4090 class cards for this approach. The Finstack itself is simple and resembles the 20 series era GPU coolers. Intel had some significant assembly challenges last time, but we don't know from here if those are improved. Board partners will have their own designs like Sparkle's Titan OC lineup with three fans. I was also really interested to hear about overclocking. It was actually somewhat exciting that this made it into the presentation because overclocking often gets a backseat to things. It's really fun to do. If you have the time for it, you want a hobby, but it's got to be well supported for it to be fun. So overclocking at launch with Alchemist last time had a lot of issues. The software was incredibly broken. We revisited the software twice, and by the second time they had really improved a lot, but overclocking still left a lot to be desired. So Intel says it has refined its software. It showed some examples of it. And in addition to the usual aftermarket software you can use to tune the GPU, Intel is also doing first-party stuff uh, that has been updated. So that maybe we'll, maybe we'll look at it. We'll see. Intel showed off a volt frequency curve to illustrate headroom for boosting. There shouldn't be any meaningful limits on anything other than the voltage, which is pretty typical to be limited in order to protect hardware. We don't have a problem with that. Intel's built-in app for overclocking shows a power limit offset, a frequency offset, voltage limit, memory speed tuning, and the expected thermal and fan targets. Then on the right side, the VF options. This clock residency slide was also pretty cool. Intel is demonstrating where power binds come into play as opposed to other limitations like voltage reliability. And based on that, the first thing I'm going to do when I stop filming here is, well, I should say the first thing I'm going to do when the embargo lifts, and it is public information, <laughs> Intel is text Joe Stepanzi and see if I can get him back up here to maybe do an OC stream with an Intel card because we've never done that before. Who knows? It could be a complete nightmare and not work, uh, or it could be really awesome. So we might do that. All right. As a refresher, wrapping this up, our prior Intel benchmarking conclusions have sort of shifted over time because it's really changed a lot. Intel has done dozens of driver patches. They've done major reworks with Alchemist for DX9 and DX11 in particular. Uh, where it has drastically changed the performance behavior and the characteristics in games. And that characteristics there includes things like stuttering behavior, unexpected crashes, black screens, stuff like that. So they've really worked a lot at it. One of the common trends, though, even in our revisit where we were uh, somewhat positive on the, well, I would say very positive on the direction, but still middling on the recommendation, the trend is for Alchemist, even at its best, we found ourselves basically saying, look, like at the absolute best price in the best value position, there were times in the last year where the A750 really made a lot of sense on paper. But the part where it could fall apart and that we always had the caveat was 
uh, our stance has been, if you're an enthusiast, especially if you have a second video card that you just throw in if you're really upset with it, then they really made a lot of sense. But the problem was we couldn't just mass recommend it because the chance for someone getting frustrated by a day one experience where it doesn't work with the game, like we saw with, uh, I think it was Starfield or something, or just stuttering issues, general incompatibility issues. You play something old and it just doesn't work and you're just hoping that Intel goes back and manually addresses that one game from 14 years ago or whatever. Uh, those were all the caveats and the problems. So Battle Mage really needs to address those to, to cement a solid position here. And it might be, we'll see when we test it. Because uh, it's really the software stuff where if the hardware is good, then obviously that's important. But if the support isn't there, for just wide sweeping stability and uh, a, a predictable user experience, then the recommendation falls apart for anyone except for sort of that enthusiast crowd. So they've got to break that this time. And I'm looking forward to really putting the drivers and the software through the paces with the team and seeing what we can find and see what the story is and, and if they've uh, fixed those things. So the one comment we've been kicking around internally has been uh, it's just sort of opinion stuff here. AMD seems like it's really the one that's more in trouble here than anyone else. It does seem like you know, NVIDIA is out there on its own right now where Intel's not chasing the high end right now. AMD has said it's not chasing the high end. So NVIDIA is out there alone. The low end, it's like in the mid range, it's an important market and it is the biggest segment, but it's going to be AMD and Intel fighting each other. And I do wonder and feel like that might manifest as Intel taking more AMD market share rather than Intel and AMD taking NVIDIA market share. So it'd be really interesting to see how that pans out, especially because AMD right now, it's a little behind in stuff like ray tracing, specifically our ray tracing numbers. They've got a disadvantage in some games where uh, Cyberpunk with certain super high settings and Black Myth Wukong with super high settings, AMD just falls apart where NVIDIA scales well, it's maybe optimized for it, might have been developed on it, built for it, whatever. But the fact of the matter is that AMD is at a disadvantage for ray tracing. That's been true for a while now and, uh, and has been strong and raster. Now, if Intel comes in and stays better than AMD for RT, because it's already advantaged, as we saw in our last round, uh, AMD is really going to have to hit back hard with the RX 8000 series. And hopefully they do, because that'll make it really exciting and fun to cover and fun for people in the audience to actually have some really good choices uh, all at the same time, because they're all landing within months of each other. It's going to be a really busy next couple months. And uh, we'll have content for you soon. We're going to be testing it as soon as we get them in. And thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. And remember, use code PUCKGAMERSNEXUS for 10% off uh, while the code lasts. That is following our NZXT coverage. Check the channel if that doesn't make any sense to you. It still won't make sense, but it'll be more interesting. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.